By the way, how how was it with the uh, the 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 White Album tour? Um, I mean, obviously, you met. Did you meet Jason Chef there? Yes, I did. We became friends on the tour. Uh, uh, became good friends. Uh, we were able to uh, talk to each other about things that, that affected both of us. It was really good. And and he had a tough, you know, following uh, Peter Cetera. That that that's a tough gig. He was. I mean, I talked to him a few times online, and I said, I don't know how you did it, man, but uh, good for you. Good on you. Yeah, yeah. Heck of a, heck of a, heck of a job to get uh, to be able to replace uh, Peter. <laughs> Unbelievable. On the album, you've got songs like Better Tomorrow and Heaven. These are really kind of uplifting. Uh, uh, can you tell me a, a few things about some of the songs on the album? Like like uh, Better Tomorrow, for instance. What about that one? Uh, uh, Better Tomorrow came out of the, uh, the uh, terrorist experience. Um, that we that we all went through, uh, you know, ten years ago, twelve years ago. Um, uh, originally, uh, it was an, it was an idea called uh, Ship to Mars, um, and uh, I like I'm glad that it was one of the ones that Mark picked. I I, I always liked the songs, you know. I always like like that song, um, and so I'm, I'm just glad it's on there. And I'm, I'm, um, you know what? You're the second. Uh, I'm doing some interviews today. You're the second one where we started out talking about uh, this time, and uh, uh, I mean better tomorrow, uh, which surprises me because I don't. It's not the most commercial song on the record, but uh, that's what that's what it was about. I thought we'd be a lot better off instead stand, of standing off our uh, young men or young women after war uh, and telling them they got to do their part and the same. The other side is doing the same thing. They're sending their young men and women off to war and, and telling them it's time to die. And uh, I just thought that was a bit silly. And we'd be a lot better off if, if they could all sit down and build themselves a ship to Mars, you know, and do, do something destructive rather than destructive. Um, and that's, that's how it is. And then Mark uh, brought the uh, back of tomorrow into, into the song. Uh, and uh, it worked out lovely. That's that lovely. I'm glad, you, I'm glad it makes sense to you. Be true to yourself. Uh, this is something yeah. that the world needs to hear. <laughs> that'd be nice. Uh, you know, it'd be nice if the world listened to songs. That'd be, that'd be great. Uh, we might be in a slight composition we are now, but uh, again, it's, it's a melody that Matt gave us. Uh, and the lyric came out of a conversation I had with my oldest brother, Frank. Uh, uh, I wrote a, a, a lyric for the song, and again, sent it out to Mark. Uh, and he went, he got into it, and uh, he loved the idea, loved the song, the melody and everything. And, uh, you know, as he was prone to do, uh, he came up with a chorus and, uh, or a bridge, and uh, we, we proceeded to do it. Uh, it turned out really well, it turned out so well, in fact, and, uh, you know, it's become the title, title song for the record. And uh, it, is, it is a fair thing, it is a good, you know, a good thought, I think. Uh, you know, it's funny talking about my own songs like that, but, um, you know, you hope that people get some kind of uh, uh, meaning out of it, you know, out of it all. It's not just all about, you know, girls and sex and rock and roll there. Uh, I, mean, I like girls and sex and rock and roll, even at my age. But uh, uh, it's just nice to, to hear those kind of comments about the song. Um, you know, we try and write good stuff. We, we try and say things that are important to us, and hopefully they might be important to somebody else. And uh, it's very kind of gratifying when, when that happens. Uh, and, I'm, you know, I've got a feeling that a lot of people are going to like those words and like what it's about. You know? When you look back at your career, do you shake your head when you, I mean, you know, Bad Finger was known as the band with the, the you know, that had the worst luck, not only luck, but bad things happen, you know, bad things happen to that band. Uh, how do you look back at it now? What, what's your thoughts, you know, 2020, looking back? Well, my first answer to that is I think I'm a really lucky guy. Uh, I've gotten to be a, a musician, uh, for most of my life, most of my working life. Uh, there have been a couple of times in there when, when things have seemed pretty hopeless, but I've always been able to find a bit of work 
Um, you know, whether it was a day job, the, you know, I've laid carpet, I was a carpenter uh, for a while. Uh, you know, I've done, I've done a few things. I've worked in a record company, been an A&R guy, uh, produced a couple of records. You know, just, just I've been able to get by and raise my kids and, and take care of my family and stuff. Um, so, uh, but all those other things that have happened in, in my children and my wife are miracles as well. But uh, for me to have gotten to play with John Lennon and George Allison, and, you know, uh, the, the Bangladesh concert and things like that, experiences like that. I've met, you know, I met Chuck Berry, uh, Eric Clapton, Wayne Allman came to see us. Um, a lot of heroes are so Jimi Hendrix. I played his guitar backstage at the Sun Theatre. Uh, miracles. I mean, absolutely miracles. You know, why me is, is, is my first reaction. What happens, you know? Uh, I've, I've had a great life. I've really enjoyed it. And being a musician is, uh, for me, uh, the greatest thing to be. It just stunned me, you know? Stunned me. There's an old radio guy in, uh, is a good friend of mine, Tom Jeffries out of Vancouver. Uh, he asked, uh, did you use the Strat that George gave you on uh, Baby Blue? No, I didn't. I used the, uh, and it wasn't a Strat. George gave us a, uh, an SG Standard. Uh, it, it was the one he played on, I think, Rain, uh, or Paperback Writer, maybe. Uh, it was that SG he gave it to the band. Uh, Please don't look at it. Um, but anyway, uh, so no, that's the answer to the question. I used, and you can tell him this, I used a 1957 Gibson TD model. Uh, it's a Les Paul model, yeah, so I used that, yeah. Do you still have any of your guitars from back then now? Uh, only, I had a, when I joined back then, I had a 1963 Firebird 5, and I still have that, yeah. That's, that's the only one. But, well, you know, we, we lost all the money. Uh, that we made in those days, the managers took it, and uh, we ended up having to sell all the guitars and equipment that we had uh, simply to live. You know, I uh, even after selling everything and paying my bills and stuff, I had seven hundred dollars when bad thing had broke up. <laughs> so that's just the way it is. That's just the way, that's the way it was for me anyway. That was the bad side. The other side of it was all those great things. We toured consistently. We, we did about 120, 150 gigs a year. Um, we played all the great places, went round the world a few times, uh, took a couple of splendid vacations. And, uh, you know, we all, we all got married and we all had families. Uh, so I think we were all pretty happy on the whole with it. Uh, and that was the good side. That was the good side of it, you know? Joey, when you're talking about, you know, you took you took jobs to take care of your family, which is obviously honorable, but weren't there times where you were laying carpet and some guy said, wait a minute, aren't you Joey Mullen? Aren't you the guy from Badfinger? That that must have happened. It did, it did happen. Uh, you know, I'm not surprised, of course, but, uh, you know, it's just the way things go. What are you going to do? Uh, you know, I'll talk to, talk to people about what happened or talk to what I'm doing now or... You know, because I was always playing the guitar and writing songs and stuff. Uh, and I was working to support my family. Uh, and everybody understands that. And, uh, and, I don't know, God bless the people I've met anyway, they weren't likely to say anything weird about it, you know. And uh, don't I feel weird being a, you know, a, a, a carpenter? Or don't I feel weird, you know? No, I was happy for the chance to work. And, and the, having have the ability to work and, and make my money. You know what I mean? Uh, take yeah. care of take care of things that I've got. That, I mean, it's, it is an honorable thing, but it, it, it is what you do. It's you know, it's, it, I, that's what I was raised with. That's what you do. Uh, you, you you want to take care of yourself. You want to take care of your family. You've got to work. Nobody's going to give it you. You know. I know you 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 uh, toured with, of course, Todd Rundgren, and and he produced you way back then when George couldn't do it because he was uh, George left because he was too busy with the concert for Bangladesh, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah how exactly. was that, how was that ex how was that first experience with with uh, Todd? I, I know that the, the, there's so many people say there was tensions there, uh, but obviously you've made up with Todd. But but w did you feel that way going when when he took over that production? Well, yeah, uh, we, we, you know, we didn't know anything about Todd Rundgren. We knew nothing about him. He wasn't successful in England or anything. Uh, and it was George who actually arranged 
and I went for Todd to come over. Um, I got to talk to him on the bus out of Sporty my time, and uh, that was that was interesting to learn. Uh, Todd, in those days, was um, well, we we thought of him as, as very egotistical and, 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 and it was difficult to work with him. He criticised us. Uh, he gave us no uh, real encouragement in terms of our playing ability. Um, so we, we, weren't, we weren't very excited about the whole thing. But he did produce the, the biggest record we had. Um, but we, you know, like, we did Baby Blue. Uh, we did it in maybe three takes. And... Uh, which means we played the song three times for him, and we recorded it. And uh, then we then we uh, recorded the guitar solo, and we put an acoustic guitar on it. And then Pete did the lead vocal, and you know we did the harmonies and the backup voices, and that was it. Um, and then we made that record. And when I listen to Baby Blue today, it sounds like a great record to me. You know, it sounds like a good band playing a good song. And singing it and playing it properly, uh, and so it, it, we didn't understand his criticism uh, of our ability. Uh, and I'm sure nowadays he doesn't feel like that. But I told him, and I asked him once, "How come you were such an asshole to us?" You know, and he said to me with <laughs> straight face, he said, "Oh, you just remember me like that," you know. It's like he didn't, he didn't remember that he was like that, but he was really brutal. He was really brutal and rude. And, you know. I mean, we had no uh, compunction about telling this uh, at the time. Uh, so people, anybody who asked us, what was it like with John Hunkin? Well, it was bloody awful. You know? It was, he was, he was, he was, uh, he just wasn't comfortable here. And I don't know why. Maybe he thought he'd get more out of us, but he, he didn't say he had a high opinion of himself. I mean, and I suppose that's really all I should say about that, but I don't know. It's not like, I mean, I'm not arguing with him anymore. We have a good time. He sings Baby Blue with me on stage. Um, so we, we have a good time with him. But back in the day, man, it wasn't the same. <laughs> you know, I, I Die Babe is one of my favorite uh, songs from the band, and I know that George played on that and produced that song. Uh, that that song always that song always hit me. It's one of the, of all the songs I've been humming in my life. That's one of those songs. So, congrats to you because I just that 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 song hit me. Wow, that's great, man. Uh, that was a good little idea, George. That's good the song. I was going to give up on it. Uh, the lyrics weren't coming. George loved it as well. He thought it was going to be a big single for us. He really did. He really enjoyed it. And uh, he played guitar, like you say. He and I played acoustics first on it. He played that piano on it, you know, that keyboard, that do, 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 do. Uh, and then he played the solo, and George did the little low string uh, riffs on the, uh, on the strap, on his strap. And uh, great, you know, it was, it was really good. I'm glad you like it. We, it's a great song to do uh, on stage. The, the rhythm of it is, is great. Uh, you know, and just the melody is nice, it's kind of a bit old fashioned, but it's really nice. And, uh, I'm great fun. I'm really glad you like it. Are you going to be touring with bad, uh, doing the bad finger thing still when things get back? Hopefully, when things get back to normal? Sure, yeah, I'll be doing all the things that I do. Uh, you know, I don't plan on stopping doing any of them. I enjoy them all too much. You know, doing, doing, the, doing the bad finger show and singing those songs, bringing them to life. Um, perform them so that the audience can enjoy them. Uh, and that's what we try and do. You know, we try and really do them good. Uh, it's, it's a great, great way to make a nice play. <laughs> it's lovely. So, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm doing stories on the shows. Um, hopefully, the record will have some success and we can take that out on the road as a show. Uh, that'll be a fun thing to do. Um, yeah, I'm going to keep playing. The rest of my life, I'm sure. I just ran a clip from uh, Frankie Benelli, who the drummer for Quiet Riot, who just passed away, and I was telling him, I said, you know what, you're the only remaining member of Quiet Riot, but I'd rather have you going out there and still celebrating these songs and not being out there. But what do you tell critics who say it's not Badfinger? What would you tell them? Well, of course it's not Badfinger. That's why I've never made a Badfinger record. You know? 
I've never made a bad thing to record without telling me a piece of work. You know? But I do that show. I do Joe Bond's Bad Finger show. Uh, and I think people enjoy it. So, yeah, it's not Bad Finger, but they get to hear the songs and I know how to do them. You I, you were there. Hell, hell, you were there. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but, uh, you know, some people, some people doesn't talk. You know, uh, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference that I wrote over half of the music that the band uh, recorded put out on those records that they love uh, half of that those songs are mine you know yeah, str- uh, with straight up on, man on the yeah. with straight up you were all over I mean a lot of records but straight up man you were like five rights or co-rights on that album yeah that's right that's right yeah, that's a lot of inspiration. And that's a great album. Was Gary Wright really on Name of the Game? Because it says unconfirmed on Wiki. Well, uh, well, I haven't... Uh, no, uh, not that I know. He may have done an offer up for George or something. Um, but I, he was one of the sessions where the we did, that the band did, you know? Do you go back with Steve Hawley a lot? I know he's on the album. Ah, uh, Steve's great. Uh... I've known him for, oh, I don't know, 10 years or so. I haven't known him for a lot, a lot long. I, I don't have any history with him uh, from those days. Uh, or, you know, when he was with Wings and all that. Um, I don't have any, but uh, I'll tell you what, he's a fantastic drummer. <laughs> and, uh, and he was a lovely guy to work with. And I'm, I'm really happy and I'm proud that the guy came and played on the record. You know, he's one of the great players, you know, so... He's lovely. Um, boy, and he's like, uh, what can I tell you about him? I can't tell you anything bad about him. He's a real professional. You know, watching him work, something else. You know, writing his charts out, uh, making sure he had the film right for you, uh, uh, listening to the tempo and the groove, you know. Uh, just really in it, you know, in it, you know. And he really enjoyed it. And... Uh, Boy, it'd be great to bring him in the road. He's super, uh, fantastic guy, and he loves to go. And he loves going on the road. He loves playing, you know. So, what, what, did he get? Did he? Uh, did he do those shows with Mott the Hoople, or did they get a chance to do them? They got a chance to do them, right? Um, no, I believe the tour was cancelled. Um, I think uh, uh, did he get sick? Uh, the singer. Oh, Ian um, Hunter. He's the pardon. Ian Hunter. Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't know. Uh, uh, one of our uh, viewers, Conan Daly, says, how did you get in the band in the first place replacing Ron? I know that uh, there was friction with the band and Ron when he left, but so what was the call? How did the call happen that you got into Badfinger? Um, well, you know, the bass player left the band. Uh, they, they recorded Come and Get It, and then for some reason, the bass player decided to leave, and he went back home to Wales. So um, they were originally looking for a bass player. Uh, a good friend of mine was working with Apple, um, Paul and Billy Kinsley. He was a bass player from Liverpool. Uh, he'd been in the Mersey Beats and several of the earlier Liverpool bands. Good friend of Paul the and uh, so he was doing sessions for Apple. And he heard about the job. He liked the ideas, as they were called at the time. And he went for the job. And they told him when he got there that uh, they decided that Tommy was going to take over on the bass. So they were looking for a guitar player. Um, and he, and I played with Billy, uh, and, and he liked my playing, and he suggested that they get me. Uh, I, I was already writing songs, I'd already written singles uh, for a band I was in in like 68. Uh, and I'd been around the world, so I had a bit of experience uh, playing. Uh, and so they did, they called me up, I think it was like the 25th guy. Uh, Are you serious? The 25th guy? Yeah, I was with the 25th guy who came to the buy the long book. They were looking for, for something, and uh, I came down and I auditioned for them and played a couple of uh, um, rock and roll songs, you know, talk about my babe and maybe a Chuck Berry song. Uh, I told them what I liked, and uh, they gave me the job. So that's, that's how I got the job. <laughs> Someone had asked, uh, <laughs> someone had asked, they said that they really appreciated you. Um, and, and I've not seen these clips, but they said that you used to uh, play to the camera and you seemed to have fun when you were being filmed. And you always had a good sense of humor. 
Um, did you do that purposely, or was just that your personality coming out on film? Oh, it's just my personality. Well, in reality, uh, doing television and having those cameras on you, for me, it was a bit of a nerve-wracking experience. Uh, so uh, I would divert when, when I felt the camera on me or when it was in front of me. Uh, I would, I would just like, yeah, you know, the first place where my words, and that would usually be, you know, being from Liverpool, that would be some kind of fun thing, or, you know, look at the camera and give it a bit, bit of a weird look. But it was, it was because I was self-conscious uh, about it. I didn't feel super comfortable. You know? <laughs> so, you know, you just do things when you're in awkward situations, you know. Yeah. It's like when people say people mm -hmm. laugh, uh, laugh at funerals, they're not doing it because they think it's funny. They're just so uncomfortable. They don't know what to do, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Day After Day, that was a, a song. A wiki credit to you was singing uh, a, along with Pete, uh, but wasn't that an ensemble singing piece when they sang into the chorus? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, sure. You in the arms uh, We all sang harmonies, whether it was a long or a high harmony, uh, um, you know, we all sang harmony with each other. We could sing pretty, pretty good three parts. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we sang along with them. And, you know, played a bit of slide or played a bit of you know, lead guitar or whatever. You know, played a bit of guitar. Noise. Did, yeah. you, did you know that song would, would hit when, when you first heard it? Did you know? Uh, not really. Uh, it just sounded like a good, good little song, you know. Uh, but I'm not very good at picking singles or anything like that. I never was. Uh, I never thought of music like that. But Pete's songs were really successful. Uh, he was he was without a doubt, I think, at least a couple, maybe five years ahead of uh, the rest of us in terms of the depth of his songwriting. Um, great original ideas and an absolutely fantastic voice. Uh Peter's got one of those, well, he had one of those Welsh voices, those beautiful tenor voices. Um, just great. And Tommy wasn't far behind him, but he was a very talented, uh, great guitar player, too. Uh, Joey, uh, what, what, uh, what was your, what, I mean, it's a, it's a stupid question, but I've got to ask it. What was your reaction when you found out he passed? I was absolutely stunned. I was absolutely stunned. Um, uh, I think it was Tommy who called me. Uh, I was living in LA uh, at that time. And, uh, I was absolutely stunned. I couldn't believe it. He had everything to live for. He had everything to live for. Uh, but I think, um, and I don't really know uh, why he passed, why he did what he did. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think anybody can guess about that. But um, I think I understand uh, you know, what brought him to that point, you know, he, 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 he made a lot of decisions uh, and, they, and they weren't all the best. They, they, really, they really weren't. And uh, it led to other things happening. Um, and I'm sure those things might have weighed on him. Uh, but I was stunned. I had no... It's like he's going into another baby. You know? Uh, he, he, you know, of course, he did do that that night. He got very drunk. Uh, um, I don't know. I just don't know. I don't, I don't have that inside me. Uh, you know, I don't have that gene uh, that makes me think along those lines. Joey, when things were going bad with Stan and, and it, the money wasn't coming in, there wasn't a part of you that ever thought, well, what's the... Because you're not wired that way, right? You're not wired to, to do that kind of thing. People are different, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly, yeah. Uh, my, my instinct was there was no point in staying there. Because you know, the band was fractured then, you know? And a band is like an egg. You know, they, there's only the people inside that egg know what's going on. You know, but that was fractured. And we waste the ones who argue and, and, you know, not agree with each other, you know? Someone had asked me to ask you about, uh, uh, you know, you, you have a bunch of songs and you send them uh, to Mark. Uh, how far back do some of these new songs go? Oh, they, well, I don't shine uh, for one of the, the Bad Finger albums. Uh, it was, a, you know, I, I had a demo of it. Uh, we recorded it, actually, Bad Finger recorded it back in the day. Uh, we never put it on a record. Um, I don't know if our version's ever been released. Uh, it's not quite the same as the new version, but uh, that was just one of the songs that Mark picked. Um, 
But I said to the devil, you know what I mean? So uh, that's why it's on there. Speaking of that, and, and it bothered me when I read this because it, Wiki has a tendency to be one-sided sometimes when they put, they kind of almost blame Tom's suicide on an argument with you about with without you. And I mean, that's a pretty heavy accusation. I mean, what do you say to, 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 to stuff like that? Uh, well, I don't know what to say about it, really. Uh, I'm done sure that Tommy Evans didn't hang himself because of me. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> so, so uh, but Tommy and I did have a serious argument uh, the day before, but it was a, about the money that was being held by the courts in London, and the courts wanted the bad thing banned to agree on how the money should be divided, and there were certain things that Tommy agreed with and certain things he didn't. And so I said, Tommy, uh, we can't get the money until we agree. And he knew the deal as well as I knew the deal, you know, between the band. He knew what it was. And there was no getting around it. You know, Mike and, and Bill and I, we were all part of the same deal. Tommy uh, didn't like it. And then, again, there are things there that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, there are facts there uh, that uh, I don't want to be saying things about this guy's father. I know his kids, you know. I know Tommy Evans' kids and Key Tam's uh, uh, child. Uh, I know those people. There's a guy who runs the ham estate, the music side of it. And uh, his name's that Dan Matabina. He wrote a book about that thing. And it's like the whole book is like that. The whole book is in his... Uh, well, I haven't read the whole book, actually, but, but it's very prejudicial. Now, I know he meant well writing about the band and he loved the band and all that but he got some things seriously wrong and a lot of what he said is what is the foundation of those these bad things you hear um, he actually wanted me to do an interview for that book but I was already talking with a guy about writing a book about bad finger uh, a, a real writer um, I was already I was already doing a book there were no bad thing records in the stores. There were no bad thing records on the radio. Uh, there were no bad thing records anywhere. They weren't likely to be re-released, and they weren't re-released for, I don't know, 30 years, you know? Um, when, when finally EMI and Apple sorted out their legal problems, and the bad thing music came back on the stores, and then there would, there would be some kind of market for a book. You know? And he went, he went ahead with it, he wrote the book, he published it himself, and, uh, and, and there's a lot of errors in it. There's a lot of errors in there. You know? what, what, so, what, what was it like recording with, uh, with Jealous Guy with John Lennon? What, what was that experience like? Can you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine anything better than going to John Lennon's house and playing on his new record? <laughs> I, I was never stunned. Uh, and this is how those things would happen. The phone would ring uh, in Park Avenue, the Bad Finger Band House. And uh, it was a little three bedroom uh, uh, terrace house in, in London. And uh, the phone would ring, and it would be a beetle on the phone. You know, it was so unbelievable. And in this case, actually, it was uh, John's driver, Joe. Uh, he called up, he said, What are you doing tonight? I'm not doing anything. Uh, but listen, uh, John wants uh, a couple of you guys to come down and play acoustics with him, which And uh, I mean, that's the action of doing do, do him a favor to come and play, you know? And so we, we said, of course, uh, Tommy was in the house. And I asked Tommy if he, if he was, you know, cool to do that. And of course, he said, yeah. And we were the only ones there. And, and uh, so they sent a car for us and brought us down to John's house. And uh, this is when he lived in the big mansion south of London, though. And uh, it was just a, a, a little bit of a dream world, wasn't it? We went in the house, walked around it, got lost, um, found, the, found the kitchen, found the studio. Uh, you know, the front door was open. You know, nobody came and let us in. We just walked in, you know. Uh, and we finally found the studio. and All these people were there, uh, Nicky Hopkins, Jim Keltner. Posh Foreman, and uh, they're sitting in there tuning up and just doing that, and then John came in, and uh, 
Y se ha no una balada de Rita Lee, no un tal que quiere, un bolín a volar. Y me saca el John Lennon, y yo. Yo estoy en el sueño con mí, y yo. You know, the, these guys were great. They were dead normal people. They were normal people. You know, they weren't mad freaks. They weren't mad rock star freaks. They were dead normal. And he, he, uh, this next song we're going to do, the first song we're going to do, he said, is, uh, it's a song, a new song, Jealous Guy, it's called, and it goes like this. And all of a sudden, he's sitting there on his stool, and you've got your headphones on, and there's John Lennon singing Jealous Guy, you know. <laughs> It was uh, a bit of a dream world. Just fantastic. We learned it really quickly. Played it a couple of three times. And, uh, they recorded the one of them. And uh, that was that. We finished. And then we did I Don't Want to Be a Soldier. And uh, that was another, you know, kind of a Bo Diddley kind of idea, uh, was the way we thought about it. And uh, we played on that. And it was, it was absolutely fantastic. You know, to be in, in the room with them, George was there, and uh, Phil Spector, of course, Yoko came in. She was really sweet, incidentally. Uh, there was nothing nothing weird about her. She was just really nice. Anybody need anything? Uh, need some cigarettes or, you know, Coca-Cola? Uh, you know, it wasn't like everybody was boozing it up and getting stoned and loaded or anything like that. It wasn't like that, you know. Uh, these are just normal guys having a laugh and a joke with each other. Um, swearing on each other and, and learning a great song and having John Lennon sing it, you know. So it was it was it was a lovely night, and I'll never forget it. And you're the fr- and it's it. and it's interesting with Jealous Guy, especially that song. You can honestly say, well, I was one of the first people in the world to ever hear that. You played on it, but you were also one of the first people ever to hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man. John was so great, wasn't he? I mean, this is the guy, you know, you're sitting there thinking strawberry fields, you know, you're, you're thinking about this help, you know, uh, all of those songs, all those great songs, you know, I'm so tired, you know what I mean? <laughs> Come together, all of those songs, man, just unbelievable, unbelievable. Why do you think Apple Records never made it? Was They had such, an, uh, they had a strong lineup. Why do you think that, that label in the beginning didn't make it? Well, I don't know, maybe because they weren't, they weren't uh, used to having a label. And it takes work to run a label. It takes uh, expertise. Uh, it takes more than it just being a Beatle record label, you know? Uh, their, aims and their, their, their aims with that label to give artists you know, a chance uh, to actually run a record label. You know, they did things like pay the studio costs. They... Uh, gave the band's room a breathe, you know? Uh, they paid a reasonable royalty on those really comparable to what was normal in, in, in terms of that. But, uh, well, they only gave you small royalty. They paid all the expenses. They paid for it, you know? And in, in normal record deals, uh, you get a small, a small, tiny percentage, five percent or something, but you have to pay for the recording costs, you have to pay for the cover, you have to pay all the bills. You know, and you know, 5%, the record company keeps 95%. When did you think something was going wrong with Stan Pauly? When did you think something was not right? We came over, we came off a tour in 1974. we have been a little suspicious uh, because we'd, we'd like, I, I tried to buy a small verse. Uh, this was after three top 10 hits and, you know, God knows how many, how many gigs. The last couple of months, and millions of dollars were made. Millions of dollars. We took wages because we wanted to save the money. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I couldn't get a house. I was just flat told, no, I didn't have enough money. And uh, I didn't want to pay cash for it. I just wanted to put a down payment and get a mortgage, you know. Um, so that kind of rang a few panic bells. And then, you know, we drove second hand cars and stuff. We didn't have Rolls Royces or anything like that. Um, so we lived pretty modestly. modestly. Uh, in, in 1974, we came back on the tour. We just had two Warner Brothers records out, which would make the band uh, clear profit of, uh, I think, uh, $650,000. Yeah? Uh, it, it was paid to Badfinger, 
in the the company by Bigger Enterprises. And uh, when we got back to England that summer, I wanted uh, to get a TIAC full of track machine that just came out. It was a whole four track recorder, which was a major step forward in all recording. And I wanted to get one that cost a thousand dollars, and I was told I didn't have the money. Now I'd written half of these albums, you know, and I'd played on all of it. You know, there were only four members of us, but there was six hundred and fifty thousand dollars gone. Yeah. Well, um, and then one of them has put the record on. The record got great reviews. I was actually starting to sell enough to go up the charts, and. Uh, one of them found that a bunch of money had been taken out of an escrow account. And uh, it was bad thing that advance money that was paid on delivery of uh, records. And, uh, you know, it could be, it only be traced to Polly. And I know this because I sat with the president of World of Music and he told me what happened. They took the record off the thing you killed it. The record died. And they took it out of the stores. And that was the end of that. And they sued Badfinger for the missing money, the band. Well, we tried to square ourselves away here. And we started to talk about changing managers, getting a new manager. And um, three, three out of the four members of the band wanted to do it. One guy didn't want to do it. And, uh, you know, that, that, was the, uh, that was the way the band ended. Uh, that's where it ended. Because when uh, I started, uh, I'm going to leave that. And they said, why are you leaving? I said, well, there's no point being here. You know, we're not going to do anything. What are we going to do? Going to do the same thing now? That's it. And that's, that's what happened. They, they, after I left the band, they, those guys went in and made another record for Wolves, got another 325 grand. That was given to both the enterprises and the band had nothing. When Pete Allen died, which was four months later, I think five months later. He had no money. He couldn't get any money. They actually told him he had no money. And he'd written those hit records. Peter Hand wrote them. And to tell him that he hadn't done it, and he, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's unfortunate, it's terrible what happened. Uh, but for me, uh, there was no other way. I couldn't go forward with that. Well, I couldn't do it. I couldn't just continue. So I left. They got another, you know, they got another guy in. That's okay. Well, you know, it's funny. People don't bring up the idea because Peter left the band first. Um, Peter, Peter had left. Uh, and we got a keyboard player to replace him, Bob Jackson. Um, and Bob had a, had, a, had a bit of a history to him. You know, we could play and sing and write and all that. Uh, and we had a good little band. It's, it's the bad thing about... Uh, the peak came and saw uh, at our rehearsal place. We have a little, little groggy kind of rehearsal room on Denmark Street in London. And he came down, and I think he was surprised because we were singing three part harmony and we were playing our songs. And uh, we were in a little rock and roll band. And the next thing you know, he wanted to come back in the band. And, uh, and he did. And there was some. With all the bad luck, what do you think would have happened without without uh, bad management, without Apple crashing? What would have happened to without the suicides? Obviously, what would have? I, I think a lot of people are saying Badfinger would have been the biggest band in the world. I don't know. I don't know about that. Uh, but I, I think we could have. We would have been together. We would have still been together making records. Uh, and that that was really it. We, you know, we did our best in the studio. That's what we were. We wanted to be the best band in the world. We don't see people like the Who and the Stones and you know, uh, you know, the American bands are great as well, man. We go and see these bands and we always felt like we were the worst band in the world. You know what I mean? Uh, they were so good. Uh, we thought we could maybe write a song or two, but uh, we really desperately wanted to be a great band. We, it was something that was in every band's mind they wanted to be a great band, but. Uh, we just didn't see ourselves that way. So uh, maybe we worked a little bit harder. Who knows? You know. But I think in answer to your question, yeah, I think we would have stayed together. I think we would have been great friends because we were great friends. And uh, I think we would have gone on and done good stuff. I do. Uh, whether we would have become the biggest band in the world, you never know, do you? Who knows? You know? 
looking back, and you kind of answered it in the beginning, but do you have any regrets looking back at uh, uh, at any any regrets in your career? <clears throat> well, I suppose uh, in, in the bad thing uh, uh, world, uh, uh, I regret what happened with the band. Uh, I, I really enjoyed my time in the band, and I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to, you know, be any part of breaking up the band, but it's just become evident. Anyway, uh, no, 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 not really. No, I've done a few things that maybe I shouldn't have done. I've said a few things that maybe I shouldn't have said, but uh, I don't think any more than anybody else. And I don't wish anybody any harm, and I've never tried to do anybody any harm. And so, no, not really, not really. All things must pass. What was your? Uh, what did you do on that album? I played acoustic guitar. Um, we played on. Uh, I always thought we played on all the tracks, but I'm now not 100% sure. Uh, we just played every day with George for about two or three weeks. Uh, we did all those basic tracks. Um, again, it was a, it was such a, you know, an enthralling thing to do, be in a studio with all those giants. Um, and they're all playing for George. George is telling everybody what to do. And he did it in a really nice way, of course. Uh, well, it was such a great experience. I mean, you know, it was like you were just in the band playing with everybody. It was superb. And the songs were great. We had to be aware of darkness. It's a pity. Uh, all, all things must pass. Just great tunes. Um, we, we had a lot of fun. Some good jams. Really great Indian food. We did it at Abbey Road uh, in, the, in the smaller studio. It was, it was lovely, man. One of the great experiences. You know, 